uh, Ian Anderson, the, the lead singer of Jethro Tull, who's famous for standing on one leg and playing the flute, said, I I'm really in a bind now that I'm in my 70s because if I come out here and stand on one leg and play the flute, they say, he's just a silly old man. He's still standing on one leg and playing the flute. And if I come out here and I don't stand on one leg, then they say, you see, he, he can't stand on one leg anymore. He's too old. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to try and sprinkle in um, some new stuff, some old stuff. And to situate the Harrison Project in the year 2020, which is so tricky because I've been working on this project for about 20 years. And I sure thought I knew what was going to happen in 2020 for the big celebration. And everything changed. And so I want to spend some time thinking and, and talking about that as well. So now I'm going to show you my Zoom skills and go down to share screen and hopefully this will work. And let's see. And see if I can do, all right. Success, we see it. <laughs> all right. So um, on the on one corner of the screen, you see the our new book that came out, Born a Slave, Died a Peer, by Pioneer, Nathan Harrison, The Historical Archaeology of Legend. And that's something that was a couple of decades in the making. And it really was the, the summary of over about a dozen years of, of dozen field seasons of archaeological work, uh, a bunch of student theses, student directed readings, um, and what in total was over 50,000 artifacts tying into this most interesting individual. Uh, I'm going to take a second and read the prologue from the book because it's my favorite part of the book and I just want to set the stage for this project. And so it begins August 1897, late morning. High up a dusty and desolate mountain road stands a lone figure, unmoved by the dry wind and searing sun. Wildlife pulsates around him. A jittery lizard pops up on its forelegs, hungrily eyeing an oblivious beetle, only to be skewered by the talons of a hawk diving silently from above. The man's attention is focused far from these ever-present natural rhythms of predator and prey. His gaze is fixed on a slow-moving horse-drawn wagon five miles below, creeping along the serpentine path. As the sounds of creaking axles and groaning wagon wood echo across the valley, a team of sweat-soaked horses snorts, wheezes, and sighs in weary response to the unrelenting terrain. A half dozen passengers chatter nervously, warily eyeing the precipitous drop along the side of the narrow and shoulderless rutted road, eagerly anticipating the exotic world at their alpine destination. Hours drift by with little apparent change. The wagon inches up the mountain and the man rarely stirs, except to take a slow drag from his crusty applewood smoking pipe, adjust his weathered dungarees, which are missing their top button, and wave away the incessant gnats flitting about his tattered cowboy hat. Those strangers, the wagon-borne visitors, are coming to see him, like so many others before them. He will likely greet and delight them with free water for both human and beast, and a recitation of tales regarding the natural wonderland that is his home, although he always maintains the option of disappearing into the surrounding woods long before their arrival. Yet now, as the wagon driver scolds his stubborn horses for resisting the steepest pitch of the grade, the deliberately inert figure on the barren overlook makes no effort to ease their journey or hasten their arrival. His own path to this very spot decades ago had been fraught with unimaginable hardship, and he is content to sit back, wait, and watch. So that's how I opened the book, and I wanted to in sort of a grapes of wrath kind of way, just set the scene for not only all the work we've done, but about this individual biography, because we are talking about a, a single individual here. But I wanted that natural backdrop to then be filled in with all the historical and cultural context. And part of that is because, well, I'm gonna move these guys around here. Um, part of that is because there are so many tall tales of Nathan Harrison that many of us are familiar with. Uh, what's interesting is when I was working at Jamestown 
and was getting ready to interview for the San Diego State job, that's when I first came across Harrison. Um, because I wanted to think about were I fortunate enough to get this job where I'd want to dig. And there were so many stories of Harrison out there. And what I would soon learn was that most of these stories were entirely false. That's not, that's not too surprising considering the time period, but at the same time, the extent of the fiction was the part that was so stunning. If you, you look on the side of this PowerPoint slide, you can see that just about every famous moment in Southern California history um, has Harrison placed at it. We joke that he's the, the Forrest Gump of San Diego history and that he's everywhere in the background, whether it's marching with the Mormon Battalion, uh, encountering Joaquin Murrieta, opening Tejon Pass, on the posse that lynched Joseph Smith's killer, Palomar Mountain being named Smith Mountain during these times. Um, he was even a, a family member of Helen Hunt Jackson who wrote Ramona. Um, there's so many stories about Harrison and this really was the, the opposite for so much of my training in historical archeology span that privileged sites with a lack of documentation. Uh, suddenly I was confronted with the fact that we had a ton of documentation, except so much of it seemed to be false. And, and this was very interesting for me because when you think about where I was coming from, 1607 Jamestown, which is an incredibly early site for historical archeology span and also doesn't have that much literature tied to it in terms of firsthand primary histories, this site was just the opposite. It wasn't very early and there was a ton of literature. And the interesting thing is, is that made it all the more engaging for me. I, in my mind, that made historical archaeology even more important to this project um, because there was such reconciliation that had to be figured out. Now, one of the most important things for me when it comes to this story of Harrison is to emphasize that Harrison's story isn't the quintessential African-American story. It's the American story. And what I mean by that is overcoming obstacle, overcoming hardship, uh, achieving something from nothing. Uh, when you think about those Jeffersonian measures of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, um, few individuals can match Harrison's accomplishment, especially when you consider comparisons with his demographics for the time period. Here's an individual who lived late into his 80s. If you believe some of the stories, he made it to 107. And this was at a time when uh, most former enslaved individuals were dying in their 30s. Uh, in terms of liberty, this was an individual who survived um, chattel slavery, survived uh, the gold rush, uh, the racial animus of the Northern California gold rush, and then survived the chaos of, of the Old West in Southern California that was full of ethnic strife as well, especially when you consider that nearby places like Escondido were sundown towns during Harrison's time, meaning that he was not safe to spend the night there, that there was threat of physical violence if he tried to, to spend the night there. Um, and so that's where we're, we're left with this notion. And it's, it's tough to figure out what the pursuit of happiness is. Um, you know, I, I think when, we, when we, we try and figure these things out, we always take it on a very individualized level. It's, it's worth noting that when Jefferson was drafting the Declaration of Independence, he proclaimed that it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of public happiness. He was talking about public good. And it was Ben Franklin who talked him out of that and said, everybody knows that the pursuit of happiness is not individualized. It's, it's only the communal good that matters. And so he convinced uh, Jefferson to remove public from that phrase, which I think is impress incredibly poignant now when you think about uh, individual happiness, individual liberty versus communal happiness and liberty. Um, when it comes to Harrison's legacy, uh, the phrase that is thrown around a lot in the literature of San Diego history is that Nathan Harrison was the first permanent African American in the region. And that word permanent is incredibly important, partly because it's tough to define. He wasn't, Harrison was not the first African American in the region. Uh, there, were, there were definitely others. He was 
the first African-American homesteader um, in the region. But permanence is something different because permanence implies a whole bunch of things. It implies not leaving, uh, but it also implies acceptance. And, and these are at the heart of the talk that I'm gonna to give tonight, this notion of acceptance, and specifically how Harrison was able to gain that acceptance in a region that was not especially warm and friendly to people uh, that have gone through similar lives. So we have a bunch of facts here in terms of trying to cobble together the, the basic facts of Harrison's life. And, and let me tell you, this is a, a tall order to try and figure this all out. Um, when I was first doing uh, research on Harrison, the accepted narrative of Harrison was that he was born in, it was born in Virginia and in the 1820s, that he was owned by a man named Lysander Utt, uh, and we found that virtually none of that seems to be true. In fact, he's from Kentucky, uh, born in the 1830s, and his owner was an individual named uh, Mr. Harrison, which was very common during that time for individuals to, named, uh, to name their slaves uh, to give them their last name as well. He comes across uh, with his owner during the gold rush, uh, works as a miner in Northern California, and then migrates southward uh, during the 1860s. Uh, this, is a, this is a common pattern where a lot of enslaved individuals who were in Northern California were treated incredibly badly and thought things must be better in Southern California. And there was a mass migration of African Americans from North to South, and what they found was that they were sadly mistaken because Southern California was largely settled by American Southerners, and whereas Northern California was settled by uh, American Northerners. And so a lot of the baggage from the American South, the precursors to Jim Crow issues of Reconstruction were going on in Southern California. And so African Americans struggled in Southern California, especially when you consider that, that Los Angeles during this time was, was a hotbed of secessionism um, during the 1860s. Um, so Harrison migrates south, and the first records that we see of Harrison being in, in San Diego County are, are in the 1870s. And it doesn't have him on Palomar Mountain during that time. It just has him in and around San Diego County. He ends up homesteading property in 1879, but that's at the bottom of the mountain. That's not where we were digging, and that's not the more celebrated area of the Harrison story. Uh, he owns a tract of land from 1879 to 82 and then sells that. And then it's a few years later when he ends up homesteading the land uh, two-thirds of the way up Palomar Mountain on eight, in 1893. It's worth noting that Harrison claimed the water track at Palomar Mountain uh, a year before he homesteaded the land. And Natalie can tell you a whole bunch about water rights and the importance of water in this region. Uh, she based her thesis on that, did some great research on that, and it's all reminiscent of uh, the Mark Twain line, that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. Now, despite all these wonderful feel-good stories about Harrison during this time in terms of his, him accomplishing so much, it's worth drawing attention to the fact that after living on Palomar Mountain for at least 40, perhaps 50, 55 years, um, Harrison gets ill in October of 1919, is convinced to go to the hospital. He lives for a year in the San Diego County Hospital um, under today's 163 um, and the 8. And he ends up uh, dying there October 10th, 1920, at which point Harrison is placed in an unmarked grave in Mount Hope. And so even though he's a celebrated figure on the mountain, once he's in the city of San Diego, he is lost and forgotten in that unmarked grave. The little graph in the, the top corner there um, just shows how, whereas most of us get a year older which, with each passing calendar year, Harrison actually went faster than the calendar year. Each of the historical records, the later they got, they put his birth year earlier and earlier. And by the time uh, we get towards the end of his life, he has great antiquity. Um, and this is part of his legend. And what's so important about this is that his legend is being well honed during his lifetime. 
It's not just after he's passed that he gets these exaggerated tall tales about him. It's something that happens during his life, and we can't overlook, overlook the fact that he was contributing to his legend, actively playing a role in this. And that ties directly to this notion of acceptance and permanence. So I love seriation. Jim Dietz was my advisor. And one thing we agreed on is that you could seriate everything. And so we did seriations of all sorts of things in the historical records themselves, like how his structure was described over time. And you'll see by the X's showing presence and the O's showing absence that in the early years, his structure was referred to in very negative terms like shack, hut, and crude cabin. And then over time, his cabin seemed to grow in grandeur and was called a house and a cabin. Uh, the word cabin was never used for his structure before 1950. And the word shack was never used for his structure after 1969. And so you can see here, the, the, it's like the, the structure he lived in was, was growing itself, was getting better and better over time well after his passing. Um, oops, I went too fast. Let's see if I can go back one here. Um, there, okay, I'll just go slowly on this. Um, we did this also, and we saw that stories of Harrison emphasized that he got smarter and smarter well after his death, and he also enjoyed alcohol more and more after his passing. Again, none of these stories were changing during his lifetime. This was after his passing, and that is an important part of the making of a legend. When we talk about his legend, though, it's hard to get past the photographs. There are 31 different photographs of Nathan Harrison. It's probably more than any other 19th century San Diegan. And what we see is, is a common grammar of these photographs. There are rules that govern these photographs of how he would be portrayed. Um, think of Henry Glassie's rules for folk housing in Virginia. Well, we have similar grammatical rules for how Harrison's image is presented to the public. He's the primary subject. He's also there with visitors and he's often there in front of his domestic spaces. One of the things that's so important to emphasize is that he is always depicted as non-threatening. Um, many of you are familiar with his deliberately disarming introduction. He would use a racial epithet to introduce himself to visitors coming up the mountain. He would say, I'm N-word Nate, the first white man on the mountain. And if you can get past that racial epithet, you will see that he is taking control of the situation He's using humor, he's using irony, and he's using a memorable phrase that no one will forget that visited him. Uh, most importantly, though, he is immediately putting people at ease by making fun of himself um, and by using humor. We have uh, accounts from one of his closest friends, uh, Robert Asher, that Harrison, when he heard people coming up the mountain, would put on his oldest and most beat up clothing. Uh, to entertain visitors. Whereas most of us put on our nicest clothes when folks are coming over, or at least we used to before COVID, Harrison would do just the opposite. He would dress down very deliberately for the occasion. It's, it's so poignant when you look at all the photographs of the time period to see that when most mountain men of Palomar were photographed, and most of these individuals were men, and they were mountain men in terms of having long beards and being very rugged. They were always photographed with their rifle. That was part of the norm for all these other individuals. But Harrison almost exclusively insisted on not being photographed with his rifle. Uh, furthermore, he was never photographed on a horse. Even though he raised horses, he sold horses, that was his one vendable commodity you won't see Harrison on a horse. And lastly, there are no photographs of Harrison off the mountain. And so you have him crafting, he and Asher, um, in terms of the photographer of many of these photos, crafting this portrait of somebody who was non-threatening, who was not mobile, and who would be found there at Palomar um, and not in your backyard in San Diego. Very, very deliberate. Even the trip up Palomar Mountain was a fantastical journey. Um, and it, it's worth emphasizing that Harrison on Palomar Mountain really is 
two temporally discrete stories. There's the 1865 to about 1890 story that is Harrison as a rancher. And with that, he has horses, um, he's uh, taking care of sheep, he's doing horticulture, he's, he's building fences, he's building shingles. He's an active part of that laboring community there on Palmar Mountain. Once you get to 1890, though, from 1890 to 1919, Harrison becomes the central tourist destination for San Diego. It's really San Diego's first touristic hotspot. People go up to Palomar Mountain to see him, and he is putting on a show for them to give them exactly what they want. The trip up the mountain, for those of you who have ventured up Palomar Mountain, you know that that road is not much better today than it, than it was back then. And it is a very difficult journey. It's a, it's a single lane road, it's unpaved, there's no shoulder. Uh, back in the day, it took three days to get there. One to get from San Diego to Escondido, one to get from Escondido to Tin Can Flats, and then one day to get up the mountain. Um, now, it doesn't take nearly as long, but it still is that, that huge journey. And, and back in the day, it was this rite of passage where you were leaving your world behind you were going through this liminal state. You literally pass through the clouds and you enter in this new world, uh, just like Alice in Wonderland, except she falls down the rabbit hole. You're going up the mountain. And the first thing you see is this sort of ironic nonsense, just like the nonsense that Alice runs into. Uh, Harrison immediately calls himself a white man. Uh, he puts on a show, and you get to see these inversions, these reversions. He makes lots of plays on race and makes jokes about race uh, during at a time when race was not a joking manner at all. Uh, and, and this is all part of, of who he is. One of the most spectacular artifacts that we found in the site is in the lower left corner of the slides. You see a camera lens from one of the original Brownie cameras at the turn of the century. Um, really fun to find an artifact that has such a direct tie to one of the key aspects of the Harrison story, and that is photography. Uh, Harrison was close with both Ed Davis and Robert Asher, two of the most prolific photographers of the time period. He also was this tourist destination, and so many individuals going up the mountain were bringing cameras just so they could take that photograph of him. It's worth emphasizing that Harrison used these photos very differently than Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, interestingly enough, was the most photographed 19th century American, uh, more than Abraham Lincoln, uh, more than General Custer. But Douglass used photographs as a tool of empowerment. Uh, he always dressed up in his finest clothing. He always put on the most stern look on his face, stared right into the camera, wrote many essays and gave many speeches about empowerment through photography, how photography was going to help catapult African Americans to acceptance, to higher status, and to not having to live at a secondary state in uh, the American world. Harrison was very different with these photographs. Um, he did not present himself as an intimidating picture. If you look at that uh, intimidating figure, if you look at the picture bottom central, you'll see Harrison with four white women and they brought him a bouquet of flowers. Uh, again, nothing threatening about this image that he is portraying to the public here. So when we started doing the excavation, um, the area was, was waist high with weeds. The, the only inhabitant in this part of the property were a few rattlesnakes and scorpions. Uh, we started digging in 2004. The Kirby's owned the property at that time. They graciously allowed us to dig, uh, to run a field school. And we were fortunate enough to immediately find the foundation. It was on, underneath only a, a few inches of dirt. And we were able to see very clearly the layout of the cabin. And what's nice is there are a bunch of old photographs of the Harrison cabin while it was still standing. There's one from the History Center there. Um, but we got to learn a lot more when we actually saw the footprint in the ground. Uh, Matthew Tennyson did his MA thesis at San Diego State on the physical form of the Harrison cabin that was very enlightening as well. Um, and what we saw with this cabin, once it was excavated, 
was how deliberately it was laid out. It is a perfect 11 foot square, so much so that the diagonals are each 15.5 feet. It has a sunken dirt floor. Um, what we got to see was a meaningful construction of this cabin. Um, even though it was a single person construction in terms of the size of the cobbles and some of the historical references to it, um, there was nothing crude about the layout of this cabin. And what's fascinating is if you scour the historical records, uh, you will see that some of the people that visited the cabin, they were aware how different this cabin was from anything else in Southern California of the time period. Um, they knew not only by the construction, but also by the fact that the interior of the cabin was so clean and the patio was the main activity area. All of this tied to a different geographical region and a different time period. And this is where one of the visitors to the Harrison cabin in the 20s noted that this cabin was straight out of Dixie. And what we end up seeing by that phrase and through our analysis is that this was just like a slave quarters from the antebellum south. Uh, when you look at contemporary structures, you see no structures in San Diego that have that square floor plan. Um, you see rectangular floor plans in a lot of the different European traditions. You see circular floor plans and oval floor plans of a lot of the indigenous uh, structures. Square is a huge anomaly. Um, and that is something that drew back to my work on the East Coast, where in Virginia and in the Carolinas, I had excavated numerous slave cabins, and all of them were square and plan. All of them were one-room houses. Um, all of them had end chimneys, lean-to chimneys. And this is where it was so strange to see something that seemed to be out of place and out of time, and yet still drew on some of the natural environment. If you go up to Joshua Tree, you'll see a lot of the miners cabins there in those lower two photographs that are made out of the cobblestones that look similar to Harrison's cabin, except they're rectangular in their floor plan. And so you have this, this hybrid that is a physical form that looks just like the antebellum south, but is made out of materials um, that are right there on, on Palomar Mountain. It's also worth noting that there are certain things that were commonplace in the South, like root cellars, that we didn't see in the Harrison Cabin. And the Harrison Cabin can inform many debates on the East Coast about were these root cellars, were they hidey holes for goods um, as enslaved individuals? Were they storage cellars for root vegetables? Um, what's interesting for the Harrison Cabin is we see that he builds this as a free man and furthermore, he is growing all sorts of root vegetables, but there are no root cellars in this cabin. If you're looking at the Harrison cabin, not only do you need to look at the structure of the cabinet, but you need to look at its exact placement as well. And what's so important about this is he managed to place it right next to the most prominent indigenous Luisenio Trail of the time, and also next to a road, a, a western county road running up the mountain. The star is where the cabin is, the gold line is the active Palma Trail, and then the black line zigging and zagging up the mountain, that was the county road itself. And so you see the strategic location of this, that Harrison places this cabin at a spot where he both intersects with two of the major communities at the time, and yet at the same, at the same time, this is one of the most defensible spaces in all of California. He has the high ground, all those switchbacks, they are just like ramparts on a fort. Now, this is a most defensible space and he can disappear into the woods as it takes anybody uh, a day to get up the mountain to come visit him. Now in terms of the archeological artifacts, we found over 50,000 artifacts and all of them fit into a very tight date range. Um, that was bounded by 1865 and 1916. Um, our, our early date came from um, the end dates on a uh, four-hole uh, uh, four sunken panel button uh, identified by Stanley South in his South Carolina co collection, um, as well as a whiteware maker's mark. And then the 1916 TPQ was by a couple of dated items, including a, a 1916 Buffalo nickel. Uh, we have artifacts from the site that tie specifically to those photographs. 
Um, you get to see the the mouthpiece of the smoking pipes that that Harrison was often photographed with. You get to see the watch chain, uh, the watch fob on his pocket watch, his boot, and so forth, all very crisply in that date range. What is nice is we get to see that occupation in the 1860s there that helps to narrow down for us when was Harrison there. Now, he likely was there just as a seasonal occupation uh, when he was taking care of, of sheep in the 1860s and it became more of a permanent occupation, 1870s, 1880s. Uh, but the date range could not have lined up uh, better with, um, with our records and also helping to answer some of those questions. We get to see um, all sorts of aspects of his life uh, verified by the artifactual assemblage and it also helps undermine one of the nastier racial stereotypes that you hear from the early historical records that emphasize that he was living that he was lazy and living on handouts of others. Uh, we get to see um, that he was self-sufficient, he was canning goods, he was jarring goods, uh, he was a great cook, and we get to see baking powder tins. We get to see him butchering fauna, both wild and domestic. Uh, we see ample evidence of his uh, rifle, over 100 different rifle cartridges. Uh, we we're even able to pull the thumbprint off of one of the rifle cartridges. Um, when, when a rifle cartridge is being loaded, the oil from the thumbprint gets transferred onto the cartridge. And then when it's fired, the heat cauterizes the oil and it actually burns that thumbprint onto the rifle cartridge. Um, and even though it was in the, the ground for over a hundred years, uh, we were able to send it to a forensic scientist in England who was able to pull Harrison's thumbprint um, off of one of those fired rifle cartridges. Um, we also get to see ample evidence of the, the horses that he raised there in terms of uh, horseshoes, horseshoe nails, uh, dozens and dozens of harness implements and buckles. And so we see his activity there at the site in terms of both cottage industry and, and diet. Uh, in terms of, of faunal remains, Kristen Tennyson did her thesis on the, the faunal remains. Um, and Rachel Drossler also used it as a case study in her work. Um, and we get to see that sheep definitely dominate the assemblage. Uh, if you take a deep dive into the Harrison book, you'll see that sheep uh, were incredibly important to Harrison. In fact, he married an indigenous woman whose son was one of the biggest Mexican sheep ranchers um, in the region. His name was Fred Sheep Smith. That was his actual nickname. Um, and we found uh, multiple pairs of sheep shears at the site as well. And when you start scrutinizing the old historical photographs, you get to see hides there next to Harrison on the, on the cabin through the years. It doesn't look like he was tanning any of the hides in terms of the soil chemistry and other artifacts we've been looking for, it, but it, it, it does seem to be that he's doing the taxidermy, that first stage of, of the hide production. I talked about all the, the horse hardware. Uh, this is something, whether it's the rowels off of the spurs, um, the buckles for the harnesses, um, different bits um, from the, the harness of the horse. Uh, we see that all over the site. And what's so important about that is there's a moment in 1913 where Harrison was no longer paying property tax and somebody else manages to get his property at auction. Um, and when he does that, um, he's devastated that someone else has acquired his property. The local community rallies to his aid and says, there's no way we're going to let this other person take your property. All the people from the mountain, they call upon the, the local congressman, uh, Million Dollar Kettner. Uh, they, they get the powerful people on Harrison's side, and they work out a deal that Harrison is, will give uh, this, this shyster that, that stole his property, he'll give, his name was Hargrave, he'll give Hargrave a horse in exchange for getting his property back. So we get to see the horses were incredibly important, not only in terms of his livelihood, but in terms of keeping his property in, in 1913. There is something different about the artifactual signature at the site um, that ties into 
those hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of people that came up the mountain to visit Harrison during the, the last two decades of his life. If, if you take a, a close look at the work that, that Steve Van Wormer, and I know that Steve worked with Tim Gross on a couple of the articles as well, the, the signature of different sites during this time period, you see um, a signature for urban sites, you see a signature for rural sites, and you see two different statuses within the urban sites. And you would expect the Harrison site, because it is so rural, to fit in with that Van Wormer classification of rural sites, but it doesn't. And it doesn't in the coolest possible way. It, it's a perfect match except for the traditional gift package that tourists brought Harrison when they came up to the site. There are lots of different records that emphasize that when people went to visit Harrison, what they brought them were a pair of pants, a bottle of alcohol, and a can of food. And what's so fascinating is we have a couple hundred of each of those, bottles of alcohol, buttons, and cans of food. And that is what takes the Harrison site and makes it seem a mix of statuses. That's what confuses it. Um, if you removed all that, then it would be that typical rural site. But because Harrison had this very different aspect to his life, being this, this local celebrity, being this icon, you end up seeing this mix of items where suddenly you have cardboard puzzle pieces, you have fancy garters for socks, you have presidential suspenders, you have a silver quarter from 1899, you have thermometer parts, you have all these things, you have a tin of white makeup, all these things that don't seem to belong, but that reflect his intersection with so many different visitors. Um, and that's what's so fun about this site, is in some ways it is typically San Diego, and in other ways it takes that and then completely twists that around and turns it into something different. So I, I like to make a, a big deal about taking in all the stories of Harrison in a most rigorous way, but then also leaving room for things like metaphor, allegory, and symbolism. And it's, it's an awkward mix. You know, it, it, it's one of these things, you know, trying to, trying to bring together some of the science of the new archeology span and then some of the symbolism of post-structuralism, that's not an easy blend. But I think we can see it in this case study. In fact, we can even see it in individual artifacts. Um, this is something that I know many of you have heard me talk about before, but I love that little bottle on the top right of the screen that is the Murine Eye Remedy bottle. And, and I love it because it both is, is literal and symbolic all at the same time. So we found this almost the first day of excavation. And it's this great little bottle from the early 1900s, and it's an eye tonic. And for anybody who spent time up at Palomar Martin, you know it's incredibly dry and dusty, and having something to soothe your eyes would be perfect. And in fact, we found an advertisement for Murine in a book called Homestead on the Hillside that was published in 1896. It's based in Iowa, has nothing to do with Harrison, but it's a nice little coincidence as well. So all this seems to, to make sense until you start researching the Murine Eye Remedy Company, and you realize that this company is a total farce. This was, first of all, the product had borax in it. It was terrible for your eyes. Um, secondly, the company was started by two brothers, the McFatrich brothers. I'm not making that up. It's right out of a Mark Twain novel. The McFatrich brothers got fat and rich off of the Murine Eye Remedy, which didn't help your eyes, they started a fake company, and in fact, they started a fake college, a uh, college of ophthalmology, where they allegedly developed this product, none of which was true. They gave out fake college degrees, offered fake college courses, all to support this quackery that was their product. Um, and that's where it all comes together for Harrison, because Harrison is living in this wild west where you have shysters coming by all the time trying to dupe you into buying things. And yet at the same time, he's also in this period post second industrial revolution where all these products are coming into the area. And so you have access to these goods all at once.
it's this perfect blend of items. And you also have the fact that, that Harrison suffered from glaucoma. And so he probably was looking for some sort of eye remedy. But this all gets embodied in this one singular artifact. And so one thing I try and do is keep in mind all those stories of Harrison. I want to saturate us with all these stories of him as a pioneer, a mountain man, uh, playing the fool, a uh, hermit, a tour guide, a mythmaker. But at the same time, I want us to involve his agency. And I'm going to switch PowerPoints now because the second part of this talk, it's shorter, but it's all about the hidden surprise at this site. So we'll skip that slide, close this out, see if I can share screen again. All right, so the second part of this talk, let me go to play from the start here, is about minstrelsy, minstrelsy and that is putting on an act for all of his visitors. Uh, I'm going to skip this. So we talked about all these histories of Harrison. And one of the things that started becoming clear the deeper we got into this site was that there was a good chance that every history about Harrison was wrong. And what I mean by that is all of the stories talked about this persona of Harrison that he presented to the public but none of them said that it could be an act. They all bought into the fact that the clothes he was wearing were the only clothes he had. They all bought into the fact that the broken English that he spoke were the only words that he knew. They all bought into the fact that him being self-deprecating and insulting himself by calling himself N-word Nate, that that was who he was. And what none of them got was that he was putting on an act and that he had a secret double identity. And this is the big punchline to the book. And this is why archeology span was so absolutely essential to this site. And it answers the question, why should you dig a site that's so late and has so much documentation? It's for the simple fact that all the documentation can be wrong and that this lateness may tie into current stereotypes and current inequity that is still going on. So Harrison presents himself as this likable individual. And when he says that he's N-word Nate, the first white man on the mountain, he tells a joke and immediately white people no longer feel guilty about slavery. He tells jokes about race and miscegenation and everybody laughs and is put at ease because if Harrison's not upset about slavery, if Harrison's not upset about sundown towns, if Harrison's not upset about the Confederacy having a strong presence in Southern California, then they don't need to worry so much about it. And what's so fascinating about all this is that this was going on throughout much of the United States during the late 1800s and early 1900s is that these minstrel acts, skits that mocked African Americans, peaked during 1890 to 1920. Those are the 30 years where Harrison is the touristic hotspot for San Diego. In fact, every town had amateur minstrel groups. And if you read this quote here, you'll see that um, the African American poet James Weldon Johnson noted that the minstrel shows fixed the tradi tradition of African Americans as only irresponsible, happy-go-lucky, wide-grinning, loud-laughing, shuffling, banjo-playing, singing, dancing sort of being. Now, Harrison didn't play the banjo, but he fits into all the others. He plays the fool, and he gives people exactly what they want to see when they come up the mountain. Now, what's so important about this is that Harrison's minstrel act was nearly identical to minstrel acts that are going on across the country. And they were... African Americans were presenting black culture to white audiences in this cartoon that was exactly what white audiences wanted. And famed anthropologist, former student of Franz Boas and author Zora Neale Hurston did a study collecting folklore and talked to minstrel performers and they told her 
that I'll set something outside of the door of my mind for the white man to play with and handle. He can read my writing, but he sure can't read my mind. I'll put this play toy in his hand and he will seize it and go away. This was part of the norm for African Americans. And then it got even more bastardized because then minstrel acts started becoming white people in blackface. And so the distance from actual black culture kept getting exaggerated, but it was all an act. And it was an act that white people all fell for. So you may ask, why was a dual identity necessary? Well, this is something that um, Shelby Costellas brought to my attention and she did her th uh, thesis on ethnicity at the Harrison site, outstanding work as well. And there was an example of an individual who was remarkably similar to Nathan Harrison named John Ballard, also from Kentucky, also a former slave. He homesteaded in Malibu, just on a mountain in Malibu, just like Harrison, except he didn't put on an act for people. He didn't self-deprecate and the locals burned him off the land. So in terms of space, time, and form, you have an exact parallel with Harrison, except he didn't put on an act and they ran him out of town. And so this was a matter of life and death for African Americans during this time period. They had to put on an act. And this is where it gets so fascinating because when you start scrutinizing the records, you realize that Harrison's secret identity actually had a second name. He was Inez Harrison to Native Americans and Mexicans. He was baptized Catholic by the Rincon chief, Chief Juan Sotelo and Encarnacion Calac. He spoke Luiseno. He was part of their community. At times he had married different native women. And at the site, we found an iron cross and a native greenstone pendant. What's so fascinating about the location of his particular site is Harrison both homesteads the land and has ownership through US American law but he was also given the land by the local Luiseno. And in exchange for being given this land, he gave them unrestricted access to all their sites on top of the mountain. One of the most poignant artifacts from the site, if you look very closely at the bottom of the screen, you will see a busted portable matate that was found right next to the debris from the cabin. And many of you know all about local indigenous culture and that a broken matane symbolizes the passing of somebody dear. That one stares us right in the face. Was that broken in honor of Harrison's passing? Was that broken in honor of the passing of one of Harrison's indigenous wives? I don't know, but it's pretty profound to have it right there on the surface at the site. Uh, here's a picture of the Kalox, um, Harrison's godparents. Uh, J.P. Harrington actually photographed and interviewed them. Um, and so what's so fascinating is that when you look at the different histories of Harrison, you see two very different oral histories, depending on whether he's being interviewed by white speakers or indigenous speakers. And we see two totally different identities. And this is where the rifle becomes so important for Harrison's story. He's almost never photographed with his rifle, and yet we find hundreds of fired rifle cartridges. Many of them match the same caliber, the same size. And yet, according to California state law in 1854, the sale of firearms or munitions to California Indians or persons known to associate with Indians was prohibited. Harrison couldn't legally own any of this stuff until the law was repealed in 1913. And what we end up seeing is that he hided his self-armament. He also hided his literacy. We find multiple uh, pieces of evidence that he could write, sharpen pencil lead, pen caps, erasers. And yet on all the historical records from the time period, he would sign with an X hiding his literacy because literacy was a threat to the social order. And so there's this irony of faking literacy illiteracy while registering to vote, claiming water and owning land. Think about it for a second. While he's making these great social strides, registering to vote, claiming water and owning land, he's pretending that he can't read and write. Harrison was, this strict, was a trickster, which has this long legacy in African-American folklore and culture. And what we end up seeing is that that trickster character is all about outsmarting stronger opponents. And that is also the original character who wears a mask. 
And that is exactly what Harrison was doing during this time. He was wearing a mask for the visitors. One of the most famous poems from the 19th century was Paul Lawrence Dunbar's critically acclaimed lyrical poem, We Wear the Mask, it was all about putting on a false front um, for white people as African Americans dealt with Reconstruction and Jim Crow. I'm going to skip because I've gone on rather long, but I, I do want to emphasize we have a lot of irony at this site, high status goods, low status goods mixed together, and that was also part of uh, the trickster. And so we have this tale of two Harrisons during this time period. We have an individual that had achieved more than any other African American and yet put on a minstrel act and was so self-deprecating self, self and self-mocking during the time period. He cloaked every act of separation with an offer of inclusion, and that is how he was able to achieve this sort of permanence. And I'd like to leave you with a, a question on this front, and that has to do with what's going on with Black Lives Matter, going on social unrest across the nation right now, and ask you, do ethnic minorities still need to put on an act to gain acceptance? Uh, in terms of dealing with inequity, um, is that the only path to equality or is it time for a change? Thank you all for joining me through all of this. Let me close out of this and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Malias. That was fabulous. Thank you. Fascinating. And if anybody wants to, you can type your questions in the chat um, if you have any questions or raise your hand if you guys know <laughs> how to do that and you're um, in the Zoom thing. Anyone? Or just speak up Rachel. <laughs> so after he died so the cabin then went to a different owner or where exactly yeah. um, so so he dies away without a will uh, known as intestate um, and so they auction off the property um, and it gets passed through a series of different landowners through the years so they auction off the property and that property pays off his medical bill. Uh, it was almost the exact same amount, it was about $600, and that's what a year staying at San Diego County Hospital cost. Um, there, there are many things I didn't cover with this, and there are two things I wanna emphasize is, one, we have a big exhibit that's gonna open up at the San Diego History Center this spring, including a reconstructed cabin, lots of artifacts, all sorts of cool stuff, so you'll get a more complete story. Um, and two is, about 50 years after Harrison's passing, a local, uh, a local historian named Ed Diaz did research, found Harrison's grave, raised money to have a proper gravestone placed at the site. Um, so th there is a happy ending to that story, even though it still was 50 years for him in an unmarked grave. Uh, but, but that is a, a key part of the story, is how he's a legend up on the mountain and everybody delights in him up on the mountain, but he, when he's in the city of San Diego, there's no celebration. He's, he's lost and forgotten. Um, another question, I'll combine these two. Um, whether or not his multiple wives, I think he said he had two or reports of at least two yeah. wives, and someone wants to know if they lived with him in the cabin. <laughs> those, are, those are great questions. So when trying to figure out why he was moving from different areas, they seemed to tie up to what was going on with him in terms of having two different indigenous wives. We think it, when he was at the bottom of the mountain, he was married to a Rincon woman, and then she passes away. And then all of a sudden, um, when he moves up to the, the top of the mountain, um, actually, he's at the bottom of the mountain, and then he moves out to Warner Springs, and that's when he's married to Donna Lavierla. And then they split up, and that's when he moves to the top of the mountain. I'm going to be right back. My, I have a pet who's scratching at the door. <laughs> this is the, the Zoom reality and being in the room with the, the, the food dish. Um, so that was the first part about the, the multiple wives. They seem to match up nicely with where he was living. So 
in terms of trying to figure out who was living at this cabin, that's such a tricky question. And we see a mix of goods. And some of them, if you were at any other site, you sure would say, these seem to indicate that a female was living there. Um, in, terms of, in terms of white makeup, in terms of little garter clasps, um, that may be, and, and also some evidence of children being there. At the same time, I don't want to separate out artifacts by saying this is Harrison's stuff and this is other people's stuff. In my mind, it's all Harrison's stuff. And so my, my, my answer to that is we can't tell how many people were living there. Uh, it's funny, if you, if you were at a site with 200 buttons, you sure would think more than one person was living there until you figure out that that was one of the key exchange items. Um, and you know, it's, it's wild that there were more buttons at the Harrison site than there were at, at the Whaley House site. Uh, the Whaley House site had far more artifacts, but far fewer buttons. Um, and so there are those little incongruences. And I think one of the reasons that we don't know who was living in that cabin was because that was part of Harrison's secret life. Anything that was part of that non-Protestant life, we don't get a lot of evidence of. Harrison was, was friends with Louis Rose, a Jewish pioneer. He was very close with a lot of Mexican Catholics. He was very close with a lot of missionized uh, indigenous folks and non-missionized indigenous folks. And those are the ones that are harder to see in the, in the record. Um, so that, that question is, is still unanswered. Well, that makes a good segue to the next question about, uh, let's see. I'm curious to know, this person says, I'm curious to know to what extent, which local tribes or the extent to which local tribes acknowledge their relationship with Harrison and has your work included that that part at all? Yeah, so so when we started the project, I, I sent out a notice to all the tribes and didn't get a lot of feedback back. I've, I've given tours to uh, tribal leaders from different tribes. It's a, it's a fascinating site because reservation land touches the Harrison property on three sides and there are five ma major reservations in the area. Um, I, I think that that would be another fantastic thesis topic, would be getting at oral histories in terms of current indigenous population and the Harrison story. Um, we have four articles that are coming out in the next Journal of San Diego History. Um, my students and I have collaborated on these. And one of these is a fascinating one that deals um, with some of the most famous murders on Palomar Mountain and they involve a Kalak descendant. Um, and so I think that's another untapped part of it. And I'll, I'll tell you, <laughs> when we started this project, I always had 2020 in my mind because that's the 100 year anniversary of Harrison's passing. And I thought this is gonna be our big celebration. Clearly I had no idea what 2020 was really gonna be like, uh, but in my head all along, 2020 was the big celebration for this site. And yet at the same time, there's so many new questions that have popped up. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it, brings to know, it brings to mind another question, which is how much longer are you gonna be digging there? There are multiple times where I thought we were done. Um, I thought we were done in 2007 when the Pumacha fire came and burned everything. And suddenly we saw new areas of the, the site exposed. And I know many of you have spent years doing archeology span and you can tell me, Seth, don't be a fool. The sites are never done. Um, and so we'll keep, we'll keep chipping away at it. I, I had wanted to dig this summer. We were gonna have a live feed from the site. Um, that didn't happen. Everything got shut down, but we're hoping to have a live feed from the site next year. Um, pretty much I'm gonna pretend that 2021 is, is just 2020. Um, but but this, this question of, of local tribe involvement, uh, I think is critical for this site um, because um, even though we, we've had indigenous archeologists dig with us, um, we haven't made um, the indigenous oral history is, is a key part of, of our research as well. Um, so that's something that I'd love to, to see grow as, as well. I, I think we've had seven different MA theses on either parts of this work or, or different facets of this work. Uh, and there's still more to go. Great. Um, Hector, do you have a question? <laughs> 
Or did you unmute by mistake? <laughs> okay, Hector's gone. Uh, oh, uh, uh, is there any record of his children? And do you know what happened to them? Yeah, so, so this is another one of those hugely important questions that I don't have an answer to, but I have great little tidbits to. Um, so I'm going to answer this in two ways. First is in terms of his stepchildren. So long ago, there was a photograph recovered by one of the landowners. And the photograph was an indigenous woman. And on the back, it said, from your granddaughter, Dory Mary. And we were able to track down that that's Dory Mary Smith, daughter of Fred Sheep Smith. And so we ended up finding she married a guy named Karuka Burra. Um, it was this wonderful tangent on Basque shepherds during the early 19th or the early 20th century. Um, and so we reached out to that family, the descendants of that family. Um, and unfortunately, none of them got back to us. Um, so in terms of stepchildren, we did have that one path um, that we thought was very promising. And most of the stories said that he didn't have children, but the, he had married an indigenous woman who did have kids. Um, and Dory Mary seems to be the best example of that. However, remember that story where Harrison loses his property in 1913 because he's not paying property taxes? Well, in one of the oral histories that are talking about how upset Harrison was about losing the property, he says, the reason I'm so upset is I wanted my daughter to have this. She's a nurse in New York. And that just blew our minds because that may be a reference to a daughter before coming to California. And when you think about how old he was by the time he passed, he has this whole life before the gold rush, before he's brought West. And this is where it's frustrating that Harrison is one of the most common surnames um, on the East Coast. And in, in terms of trying to, to, to figure that one out, you know, this is where I'm, I'm hoping that you know, somebody will write a great musical about this book and that'll be able to get the story out and then we'll find the, the true Harrison descendants. Uh, the, the reason a biological descendant becomes so fascinating with this story is if anyone ever wanted to move Harrison from his current resting place in Mount Hope up until the mountain. Uh, Harrison definitely made it clear to everyone how much he cherished the mountain and never wanted to pass away and be put in an unmarked grave. Um, and, and as many of you know, to, to, to move a body, you need a biological descendant. Um, so that is one of the more fascinating stories. Um, and that's something that, you know, because the, the story has been getting more of attention, we have had some people who have claimed to be Harrison descendants um, contact us. And I'm thrilled to hear it, but I'm also always asking for some sort of, of evidence on that. And, and none of those stories seem to have panned out yet. Um, but, you know, in terms of bringing this into the modern day, a, a biological descendant or even his, his step descendants would be fascinating. Any other questions? Anyone? Anyone? No? Um, I know that you, um, I, I'm pretty sure we put a link to the, to purchase the book on our website. And um, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this, then you can check out Seth's book. And, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a vaccine and everyone can come to the History Center exhibit and see the artifacts and we have a lot of neat audio and video stuff. Uh, my students had worked really hard on all of these interactive exhibits that you can touch and we're in the process of changing all of that <laughs> so you won't be touching anything now um, and, and making it uh, far more of a digital presence but we're, we're hoping the History Center will really be able to be a, a, a centerpiece for, for this project for the coming year. Thanks, everybody, for attending tonight. I appreciate y'all taking the time. Sure. And let's see, Shannon just posted the link to the book in the group chat, if you guys want to see it. Oh, and now people are asking more questions because we're about to run out. <laughs>
Um, let's see, any chance of getting DNA from that cap grape juice bottle? Um, so one of the fascinating things is the lid was still on it and it had sugar crystals in the bottom. And so I'm not sure that he actually drank the grape juice. And this is another one of those artifacts that tells such a big story because when you study Welch's grape juice, you get to see the whole story of Dr. Welch who was a teetotaler who hated the fact that when you went to church, you had to drink wine. And so he made this family fortune all because he was a prohibitionist before prohibition. And when I think about this bottle at the site, it's fascinating that one of the lone bottles of grape juice was unopened, and yet every alcohol bottle at the site was opened and empty. So I'm not sure if there would be DNA on that because I don't know if he drank the grape juice. I don't know if it slowly um, slipped out over time. Uh, in terms of what pipe tobacco do you smoke, we found a lot of Prince Albert tins um, and uh, also the curved tin, the old English tobacco can. Um, and and the, the Prince Albert one is another great one that's just this part of Americana culture. Uh, there are also stories about how Harrison would smoke his tobacco and then he would chew his tobacco and then he would dry it out and smoke it again. He would recycle his tobacco. Um, there are also stories about how he would put lizards in his coffee grinds. All this, you know, just made his stories as Mountain Man even more engaging. Um, another fun thing was one of the pipes we found was a Meersham pipe. Um, and Meersham pipes have a great backstory and are made in an area that is almost entirely Eastern European Jews. And so I get really excited that there may be a tie to Lewis Rose. Um, and Harrison worked for Lewis Rose and there are all sorts of uh, uh, great things there. And so we were able to, to tease out a lot of those things. In terms of Harrison hobbies, we see that he was a great cook. He was hired multiple times as a cook, but then we see a lot of cooking materials at the, the site as well. Uh, and so the, there are a lot of fun things that, that tie into those aspects of, of daily life as well. So I think that's all of the, the questions there. Uh, thank you all again. And it's really nice to see so many friendly faces. There's probably more people than I've seen tonight than I've seen in the last, I don't know, three months. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Malias, and thanks to everybody for attending tonight. And we will be, again with the cat, <laughs> we will be um, posting this talk somewhere once we figure out how to get it on our website. <laughs> so um, thanks again. And yeah, everybody, look, I look forward to the, to the opening of the exhibit at the History Center. Okay, see you guys next month. Yay.